Hello and welcome. My name is Anna Maria Haiba. I am an archivist in the Special Collections and Archives Department at the Glucksmann Library. And in this video, I am going to talk to you about estate collections. I'm going to start by describing what estate collections are and what makes them such a useful resource for historians. I will show you some document types that they typically contain and then I will give you a tour of some of our most important estate collections. Finally, I will say a few words about visiting special collections and provide you with a couple of links that you might find useful. So, what are estate collections? Well, estate collections are groups of documents that were created and accumulated by landowning families over a long period of time, often in the course of several centuries. They contain a broad variety of record types, as we shall see, and they often cover a diverse range of subjects. The long time span that estate collections cover is a particularly useful tool for historians because it enables them to compare and contrast things such as fluctuations in the value of land or the cost of goods, for example, and also to identify changes in fashions, lifestyles, social mores, and so on. In addition to a wide time span, estate collections can also cover a geographically broad canvas because the families who created them may have owned land in more than one county or even more than one country. They also traveled widely, or they may have had military or other careers that took them to distant parts of the world. Country estates were important sources of employment, and these collections can therefore illuminate the lives of not only the family who created the records, but the wider community within which they lived. So the combination of all of these facts is what makes estate collections one of the richest resources of historical research. They are particularly useful for economic and social historians, but because of their eclectic nature, they can provide information on virtually every aspect of history. Using estate collections does not require any specialized skills, except perhaps the ability to read handwriting, and this can sometimes be easier said than done. In this example, the reader is challenged because the writer was determined to save paper by filling a page with writing, then giving it a quarter turn and filling it again. Other documents are challenging to read simply because of the author's difficult handwriting, as in this case. However, don't let these examples put you off. With a little practice, your eye will grow accustomed to a particular writing style and you will be able to read it. Now let us look at the type of material that you are likely to find in any state collection. Broadly speaking, this can be divided into two groups. Administrative records, which relate to estate management, and personal records which relate to the daily lives and pastimes of the landowning family. Within these two groups, the documents you will find varies from collection to collection. For example, administrative records depend on the activities carried out on each estate. Was it strictly based on farming or was it also involved in, say, forestry or fishery? was their mining or quarrying activity on the estate, and so on. Likewise, personal records depend on the activities and interests of the landowning family. Were they into field sports or horse racing? Perhaps they were avid book collectors or patrons of art. Were they interested in science or photography? In other words, while certain document types can commonly be found among most estate papers, no two collections will be exactly the same in their contents. Looking more closely at administrative records, some of the most common items to be found are deeds. These are legal documents that relate to the ownership of property, either tangible, such as land or buildings, or intangible, such as a right or a privilege, for example. They can also be called indentures because of the indented line many of them feature. This was used as a form of identification. 
So two or more copies of the deed were written on the same piece of parchment and then cut apart along a jagged edge. The parts could then be fitted together to prove authenticity. There are many different types of deeds, but we will only take a closer look at one of these, the lease. This is a legal document that regulates the amount of land a tenant held, the length of time for which it can be held, the amount and frequency of rent to be paid, and any other conditions that may affect the property. Early leases in particular can be very elaborate and include maps or, as in this case, a sketch plan of the property. Leases provide useful information on the extent and nature of the lands belonging to an estate. The tenants of individual holdings, the value of land at a given time, and activities such as hunting, fishing, mining, quarrying and building, which often appear on a lease. In larger collections, leases can also provide genealogical information if they were renewed decade after decade to generations of the same family. Another document type commonly found in estate collections is accounts. These were typically entered into bound ledgers, but they can also take the form of individual monthly or weekly balance sheets. There were many different types of accounts kept on a country estate, but again, we will only take a closer look at one of them, the rentals. Rent books typically record the name of the tenant and size and value of the holding, the date and amount of rent paid and any arrears that may be due. They can also include details such as the terms under which land was held or comments relating to the tenants and the state of their holdings. In this example, the agent has made a point of noting that the tenant has a horse and car of his own and gets plenty of work in other words, he has no excuse not to pay his rent in full and on time. Bills and receipts are some of the most useful and versatile types of source material you can find in an estate collection, but also one of the most underused ones. They can provide a wealth of information on the landowning family's standard and quality of living, their diet, their clothing and education, pastimes and personal interests. In a wider context, bills and receipts provide important information on trade and local economy and they can help establish, for instance, what businesses existed in a particular town at a particular time, what goods they supplied, how much things cost and how these costs fluctuated over time. Receipts can also be stylistically interesting and provide clues about the history of advertising. In this example, the manufacturer of travelling cases has used the image of an elephant to evoke thoughts of distant and exotic destinations. In this example, the manufacturer has included a picture of his premises on the invoice to reassure his customers that in spite of a new trade name, nothing else has changed. Correspondence between a landlord and his agent can provide insights into, say, problems of estate management and the economic and social conditions of the estate and the wider neighbourhood. Petitions from tenants can throw light on disputes and other issues affecting the local community and the nature of the relationship between the tenants and the landowning family. For instance, were the tenants comfortable approaching the landlord directly as in this example, or did communication always take place through a middleman? Architectural records can provide useful information on the physical evolution of an estate and help with the dating of a building or some of its parts. Larger collections can also contain material relating, for instance, to improvements made to labourers' cottages, village renewal schemes, the construction of public buildings such as schools or churches which were often patronised by the landowner, the construction of roads, canals and importantly railways and even the erection of monuments to commemorate important local or national events. Wills and marriage settlements are particularly useful resources for local, social and family historians. They can reveal much about a person's wealth 
property and social standing, about family relationships, and on a broader scale about trends and changes in social and economic habits. Now let's look at common types of personal records in estate collections. The most obvious one is private correspondence. Letters are a goldmine for social and family historians. They provide a window into family life and family dynamics. They can provide insights into public, political and social events or topics of discussion of the day. They may contain gossip and scandal and overall they provide a level of detail about life during a certain time period that is not available anywhere else. Personal diaries reveal the writer's innermost thoughts and can therefore provide insights into people's attitudes and perceptions and changes in these over time. They commonly contain references to health, and the weather, scenery and travel, religious contemplation, and they may include eyewitness accounts of important historical events. They are also often the only documents that provide insights into the lives and thoughts of women and children who are so often left out of mainstream history. One thing that is worth noting about diaries is that the concept of them as a private document is a relatively recent one and often what has been left out is as important as what has been put in. Scrapbooks were a popular pastime, particularly so in the 19th century. These usually include collections of poems and ditties, drawings, images cut out from books or magazines, theatre programmes, tickets, or perhaps letters that were of sentimental value to the collector. Collecting the signatures of guests at the end of a dinner party was also a popular activity and along with correspondence can be very useful in identifying the social networks of landowning families. Photographs bring a wonderful visual dimension to estate history. They can capture both intimate glimpses of family life um, and significant events, social gatherings or journeys or holidays that were taken. When they are viewed within a broader time frame, photographs can reveal changes in fashion, transport, lifestyle and any number of other things. Photographs can also retain evidence of buildings that have since been demolished or changes in landscape. Sometimes they do this inadvertently. The focus of this photograph was originally Seamus the Labrador, but what makes it interesting today is the building in the background because that was demolished in 1965. When the proprietor of a landed estate was a clergyman or had sons who made a career in the church, which was often the case, documents reflecting their professional activities can be found among estate papers. These may include things like drafts of sermons, minutes of vestry meetings, tithe accounts, correspondence relating to various clerical matters and occasionally even parish records. Many estate collections contain wartime records which provide unique and very personal insights into times of strife. They can also bear witness to the tragic and often far-reaching consequences that conflicts of this nature could have for country estates, for example when the only son and heir of a property was killed in action. Now that you have a good grasp of the types of material estate papers typically contain, let me introduce you to some of our most important estate collections. I am going to start with the Dunraven papers which relate to the Quinn, a later Wyndham Quinn family, of the Earls of Dunraven of Adair Manor, County Limerick. This is one of our largest collections and it also covers an exceptionally broad range of topics. Records relating to estate administration are extensive, except for rentals, of which there are none of earlier date than 1855. As you can see from this slide, there is a very good range of title deeds and also an interesting set of building leases relating to Adair Town. 
The town as it stands today was more or less the creation of the second Earl of Dunraven in the early 19th century and by examining the leases it is literally possible to piece together the sequence in which the houses we see today were built and to identify the individual tenant builder in each case. There is a wealth of interesting material relating to the building of the family seat, Adair Manor. For example, there are letters from Augustus Welby Pugin, who is today regarded as perhaps the finest Gothic revival architect of the 19th century, and from PC Hardwick, who completed Adair Manor for the third Earl following the second Earl's death. As regards architectural drawings, however, these have been retained by the Dunraven family, but access to them can be arranged for anyone who wants to consult them. The third Earl of Dunraven was a Roman Catholic convert, and as a consequence of this, there is a quantity of correspondence relating to the Oxford movement and Roman Catholicism. These include letters from Edward Pusey and Cardinals Manning and Newman. The Third Earl's conversion is also a frequent topic in family correspondence because it understandably caused enormous tension within the family, particularly between the Third Earl and his wife. The Third Earl was also a man of science. He studied astronomy at Trinity College Dublin and later developed an interest in archaeology. He was author of the posthumously published Notes on Irish Architecture and, as you can see from this slide, his friends included many prominent names of the day. There are many interesting diaries in the Dunraven collection. For instance, there is a set of journals kept by Thomas Wyndham, who was the second Earl's father-in-law and an MP for Glamorganshire in South Wales. There are also the diaries of the second Earl's wife, Countess Caroline, which span more than six decades and, as a consequence, are really interesting and very important. And there are those kept by Lady Eva Burke, wife of the fifth Earl of Dunraven. Before he succeeded to the family title, the fifth Earl served as aide-de-camp for the Governor of Madras between 1886 and 1888, so Eva's diaries would be of interest to anyone wanting to know more about life in British India at the end of the 19th century. The Dunravens were keen sailors and yachtsmen, none more so than the fourth Earl who was also a noted traveller and a big game hunter. The collection contains correspondence relating to his attempts to win the America's Cup race in 1893 and again in 1895, and there are also letters concerning his book on navigation which was published in 1908. A couple of points need to be noted about the Dunraven papers. Firstly, the original collection has been split into two and material relating to the family's Welsh estates has been deposited at the National Library of Wales in Aberystwyth. Secondly, because the material is on loan only, no photocopying, photographing or scanning of material is allowed without written permission from the Dunraven family. However, permission can be arranged, so please do consult with a staff member if you are interested in doing this. Our next estate collection is the Limerick Papers, which relates to the Perry family, Earls of Limerick of Dromore Castle in County Limerick. This is quite a small collection of just 270 or so items, and in fact it forms a companion set to the much larger collection of Limerick Papers that is held in the National Library of Ireland in Dublin. In spite of its small size, the collection is quite diverse both in its time span and contents. For example, it incorporates early 17th century transcripts of letters and petitions which mainly concern the Sexton family's disputes with Limerick Corporation. It also includes a wonderful commonplace book compiled by Colonel Edmund Perry in the 1670s. Commonplace books were effectively notebooks into which the owner noted down information on various topics in which he was interested. This particular book contains notes on geography, astronomy and physics, weights and measures, foreign coinage, 
equine ailments, there are gardening hints and also recipes for anything from invisible ink to flea powder. In terms of administrative records, there are no rent rolls or estate correspondence, but there is an interesting set of documents relating to the family's financial affairs. These revolve mainly around the first Earl's will and the dramatic reduction in rents at the turn of the 20th century, which made it virtually impossible for many of the terms of that will to be met. There are also some interesting leases relating to property in Limerick City and a good set of documents from the 1830s relating to a dispute over title to St George's Church at number 1 Mallow Street in Limerick when the church was to be demolished to make way for the Provincial Bank of Ireland. Architectural material includes an album which contains sketches by Edward William Godwin, the architect of Tremor Castle, and photographs that were taken during the construction process between about 1868 and 1874. Apart from this aforementioned album, there are no personal records in this collection, except for one scrapbook which was compiled by May, Countess of Limerick, in the early 1900s. It contains an excellent selection of photographs, sketches and signatures collected during house parties. The next collection I want to talk about relates to the Fitzgerald family of the Knights of Glynn of Glynn Castle, County Limerick. As you well know, this family has a long history, but unfortunately the collection does not reflect this. The material only dates from 1800 onwards because allegedly the 25th Knight of Glynn, also known as the Cracked Knight, and for good reason, burned the older documents in a tantrum. In spite of that, there is still a lot of interesting material in this collection. There is an extensive range of administrative records, of which perhaps the most interesting are the deeds. They reveal the encumbrances that burdened the estate in the 19th century and the various measures that were taken to avoid insolvency. There are also good records relating to various 20th century commercial enterprises on the estate and the restoration of Glyn Castle by the 28th Knight's widow, Veronica Villiers, with her second husband in the 1950s. As regards personal records, there are two or rather three sets of diaries that are worth noting. The first two sets were kept by the 24th Knight's son-in-law, William Massey Blennerhassett. He worked as an inspector of constabulary and kept a professional journal of his duties between 1843 and 1863. He also kept a private journal in which he made brief comments on the day's events and he often embellished these with little illustrations. The third set of journals was kept by the 28th Knight of Glynn. These are available as transcripts only and some entries have been restricted for reasons of privacy. These and the voluminous correspondence of the 28th Knight and his wife give wonderful insights into the social high life of the 1920s and 1930s. However, the diaries in particular also have a more serious side because they record the 28 nights losing battle with tuberculosis. Other items worth noting in this collection are the sketches and sketchbooks from the 1850s belonging to the artist Amelie T. Amherst who was great aunt to Veronica Villiers. There is also a book which records the type and quantity of game shot by the 27th Knight of Glynn. There's an interesting recipe book from 1909 and a small collection of photographs from the first half of the 20th century. Next, we move on to the Looney Papers. This is not an estate collection as such, but rather an assortment of manuscripts that were collected by the late Timothy Looney, who was a well-known local historian from Care, County Tipperary. One of his most remarkable achievements was to recover papers from Viscount Lismore's seat, Shambali Castle, near Clahine, County Tipperary, just before its demolition in March 1960 by the Land Commission when they couldn't find a buyer for the property. 
The collection also contains a small quantity of documents relating to Castle Otway in County Tipperary and Castle Hyde and Donneray Court in County Cork. There are also Looney's research notes on archaeological and other topics that were close to his heart. However, because of the importance of the Shambali Castle records, I am going to limit my review to this aspect of the collection. The documents that Looney was able to salvage included most of the rental and other estate accounts and an almost complete set of estate correspondence by the family's agents, which extends from about 1814 to 1948. There are also more than 60 map surveys of townlands in counties Cork, Tipperary and Limerick, and some of these date back to the very early years of the 18th century. There are no personal records relating to the O'Callaghan family of Viscounts Lismore in this collection. However, there is an unusually large set of correspondence between Viscount Lismore's tenants in counties Cork and Tipperary and his agent William Rochford between 1891 and 1902. This provides a remarkable window into the lives of tenant farmers and rural communities at the turn of the century and the letters are quite personal by nature. There's also a large and very interesting file of correspondence which relates to the occupation of Shambali Castle by the Irish military forces during the emergency of 1939 and 1945. Other items of interest salvaged from Shambali Castle include an 1821 census of Clahine and records relating to Clahine Fever Hospital from the 1830s. However, as you can see from this slide, these and a number of other records in this collection are quite fragile and will need conservation treatment before they can be handled. It is worth repeating that the surviving documents from Shambali Castle represent a fragment of the original quantity of material and there are inevitably many gaps. This is of course the case with many estate collections and it is therefore always useful to bear in mind that absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. The next collection is also quite fragmented but in a slightly different way. It relates to the Carroll or O'Carroll family of Tulla and Lisson Hall, County Tipperary, and the associated families of Scott and Angus. It contains about 1,300 items, and in addition to these, Limerick Civic Trust holds assorted family memorabilia, such as medals and uniforms and portraits. As I mentioned, the collection is quite fragmented, particularly in terms of administrative records. For instance, there are some rental accounts, but not a consistent run of them that would enable conclusions to be drawn. There is, however, interesting material relating to land sales and transfers, which illuminate the precarious financial state of the Lisson Hall estate. The collection also contains material relating to the threat of violence that the family experienced in the 1920s from the IRA, which eventually led to their decision to dispose of the estate. Personal records are also quite fragmented. There is some correspondence, but it really provides only very limited glimpses of family life. On the positive side, the collection has an excellent photographic component to it and there is also a wealth of material of genealogical interest, such as family pedigrees. One further item in this collection deserves a special mention. This is a scrapbook which contains photographs, press cuttings and other items of interest relating to the Du Maurier family, who were related to the O'Carrolls. One of the best-known members of this family was, of course, Daphne du Maurier, who in her novel Rebecca created Mandalay, perhaps the most famous fictional country state of all time. This scrapbook is a wonderful example of the type of surprises that estate collections often contain. The last collection I will talk about is also our largest collection. It relates to the Armstrong family of Moyalif House, County Tipperary and a number of other families that they were related to through marriage. There are some 50,000 documents in all and these include a photographic component of some 13,000 items. 
The material spans 350 years and as such it provides an exceptionally detailed insight into the evolution and gradual dispersal of an Irish country estate. The administrative component of this collection is substantial and it includes 20th century records relating to the Ballinacore estate in County Wicklow into which one of the Armstrongs married. Records worth particular note include a series of 18th century lawsuits, some of which took two generations to resolve, a large series of documents relating to succession problems which arose from the death of the only son and heir in the First World War, and records of a stud farm which operated at Moyalif House in the first half of the 20th century. The Armstrong family produced several clergymen and this is reflected in the many clerical records in the collection. Perhaps the most interesting item in this regard is a large set of 18th century sermons because these provide insights into the religious and ethical aspects of life at the time. In addition to clergymen, the Armstrong family also produced a number of military officers. These included William Morris Armstrong, who was known to his friends and family as Pat. Pat joined the 10th Hussars and served with his regiment in India and South Africa between 1910 and 1913. He was a prolific writer and his letters and photographs give wonderful insights into regimental life in these very distant parts of the British Empire. Mostly thanks to Pat, the Armstrong collection is also a rich source of information on the First World War. In addition to Pat's letters and photographs, the collection also contains the wartime correspondence of Captain William Chemis of Ballinacore, and there are also press cuttings and wartime memorabilia from both the First and the Second World Wars. Pat Armstrong was not the only letter writer in the family. The collection is rich in early 20th century correspondence, mostly addressed to Pat's mother and his middle sister, Jess Armstrong. There are also two sets of diaries in this collection, those kept by Pat between 1904 and 1917, which also record the progress of the First World War, and those kept by his sister Jess between 1906 and 1954. As I mentioned before, the collection incorporates some 13,000 family photographs from the 1860s to about 1980. These range from formal studio portraits to snapshots of family life. There are pictures taken during shooting and hunting parties in country houses across Ireland, England and Scotland. Photographs of tenants and their families at Moyalif Castle and Ballinacore, farming activities, family pets and, as we have seen, photographs of regimental life in India and South Africa and scenes from the First World War. That brings our tour of estate collections to an end. As you have seen, estate collections are essential sources of information on the evolution of country houses in the 18th and 19th centuries and their gradual decline in the 20th century. They reveal the financial realities and burdens of managing a country house and they provide insights into the lifestyles, pastimes and social networks of landowning families and the tenants and servants who worked on these estates. They reveal changes in fashions, customs, social mores and cultural preferences and the external forces that moulded the fate of country houses and their owners over time. Before I finish, I want to say a few words about visiting special collections. Firstly, advanced booking is essential. It takes time to retrieve material and it is a better use of your time to have the documents waiting for you rather than for you having to wait for the documents. We don't allow pens because they can leave irremovable marks on documents and we will provide you with pencils so you don't need to bring your own. Laptops are welcome as are mobile phones as long as they are kept on silent during your stay. If you want to copy or photograph items, please consult with the staff before doing so because there might be copyright or other restrictions on reproducing material. 
Before your first visit, you might like to watch a short introductory video to Special Collections and how it can support you in your research, which you can find in our website. Another good resource on our website for those interested in diaries is our interactive online tutorial on how to use them for research. This consists of five key lessons of increasing difficulty and it is designed for students of all levels. You can also test your skills by trying out an interactive escape room style game which is based on real diaries from our own archives. Finally, I would like to bring to your attention our online exhibition, It's a Long Way to Tipperary, which we created to commemorate the First World War. It follows the lives of the Armstrong family from June 1914 to December 1918 through weekly updates from letters, diaries and photographs from the Armstrong collection, which allows you to follow the war in real time, as it were. I hope this video has given you a better understanding of estate collections and encouraged you to come and explore them for your own research. And when you decide to do that, we look forward to welcoming you.